Hey everyone, this is Mason and you're listening to Herb Rally. Today's episode is another edition of the Herbalist Hour. This time I'm joined by Kara Gwiz. So Kara is an herbalist, naturopathic medical student, and a former midwife. During this conversation, we chat about the influence of her grandmother, her prababcha, the traditions of Polish healing, homesteading, her herbal mentors, red clover, crow symbology, and a ton more. So I had an absolute blast getting to know Kara more. Uh, We had a great conversation, and I know you're going to love this episode. So big thanks to Kara for joining me on the show. You can learn more about her and her work at theherbfilledhomestead.com. I will leave a link to that in the podcast show notes. Also, before we get into the show, I want to tell you about the upcoming Grow Your Own Medicine Spring 2024 course brought to you by Zalish Earth Medicines. That's with Dr. Jackie Wilkins. So this course is in-depth teachings on growing your own herbal medicine garden from seed to harvest. Suitable for container gardens and balconies, raised beds, and established garden spaces. You will learn how to work with plants as medicine and medicine making. You'll learn how to harvest and process herbs, herbal recipes, and what forms they work best in. That's tincture, tea, oil, etc. As well as formulas and elixirs. There's also lots of bonus lessons on plant spirit medicine, intuitive plant medicine, water ceremonies, flower essences, lunar gardening, healing with plants, energetics of gardening, vibrational healing, medicine making, and so much more. So doors close April 7th. That's coming up April 7th, 2024 for the Grow Your Own Herbal Medicine course with Zalish Earth Medicine. And just a little bit more about it. You'll also be gifted a seed bundle and a special gift sent directly to you with limited amounts if you join before April 7th. There's also eight plant medicine monographs, which are eight to 10 pages each. So quite lengthy plant monographs. And of course, when you register, you'll receive lifetime access to this course. So one more time, doors are closing soon, April 7th, 2024, for the upcoming Grow Your Own Herbal Medicine course, and I will leave a link to that at the very tippy top of today's podcast show notes. And last but not least, I'd love to thank our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members. We really could not do this without you, so thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to learn more about the Herb Rally Schoolhouse, you could go to herbrally.com slash schoolhouse, and you could try your first 30 days for free by using coupon code podcast at checkout. And then it's only $10 a month after that. And we keep expanding upon the classes that are inside the member area. There's also herbal community discounts, private Facebook group, etc. So that's going to do it for me today. Hope you enjoyed today's episode with Kara Gwiz, and I'll talk to you very, very soon. Bye. Welcome to the Herbalist Hour. This is where community gather, merging the power of people and the flowers, the sweet and the bitter to the salty, the sour. Oh, mommy, it's time for the Herbalist Hour. Welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today, I'm really excited to have on Kara Gwiz. Welcome to the show, Kara. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled to chat it up all things herb together. We got some herb questions for you, but I also would like to talk to you about your Polish ancestry. Uh, so why don't we start things off there and we'll talk a little bit about your probacha, probacha, Anna. How okay. did uh, how did Anna influence your your life today and um, just your herbalism and, and all that good stuff? Well, that is quite the question because I have to <laughs> say she, you know, people always reflect on on the first teacher that really impacted them. And I would say that my probacha was my first teacher. Um, for those who who probably don't know, I, I wasn't born with the gift of health. So essentially, I was born very early um, and airlifted from the very small rural town where I was born to Toronto, where I stayed for, I think, about the first three years of my life. Um, and so, of course, you know, all of this medicalization and, and necessary interventions. But as soon as I got out, Um, you know, my family just really wanted to set me up for success and didn't want me on this hamster wheel. So the first thing they did was kind of take me to my prababcha, who, you know, was known in the family for her folk remedies, her cures. And um, that's who basically took care of me growing up. And, um, you know, she basically transmitted to me most of my, you know, Polish um, heritage, through the use of plant medicines for her, you know, the moment you walk in, oh, you know, my stomach hurts. It's like, here's a simple, here's a tea. Um, And she's telling you all about it. But with me, it was, it was deeper than that. You know, she really would talk to me about this connection between plants and, um, you know, just the way that they communicate. And, um, you know, for her, it was, 
it was beyond just the folk remedies that are part because it's very much embedded into the Polish culture. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just plant medicine, as it's always said, as people's medicine. Well, that's very true in Poland. They're a very agrarian society. Um, so they live very much in tune with the cycles and the seasons. And because, you know, I had been born here, she didn't want me to lose that. Mm -hmm. um, and especially with being so ill, she she said to me, you know, we, we have to nurture the plants and create this connection so that they can nurture you back. Um, so she really prefaced it as this is the way that we instill health within us. And, you know, she was known by many. And, um, you know, as I got older, it became more intentional where, you know, I went to her and I said, can, can you teach me this? And that's that's where the real teaching began. She was the real deal. So on my brief two seconds of Googling, uh, Prababcha is great grandmother. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, okay. she was. Um, she lived to be 100 years old. Um, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Not a single pharmaceutical. And actually, the only reason why she passed away is at 100 years old, um, they were so concerned about her treating herself with garlic for her high <laughs> blood pressure she developed. She took uh, a pharmaceutical and she actually slipped into a coma. And that's what ended her life. Oh, I think my gosh. Probably would have lived to be about 120. But wow. um yeah, so her herbal traditions, actually, I came to find out later, you know, it was it was a very large loss, because I almost felt like as if it was another mother that was, mm. you know, passing away. Um, but all of the traditions that she taught me, I learned had a lot more significance than what I thought. Um, because I had originally just thought that she was teaching me the traditions from our families, the village that they lived in, which is called, there's no real English uh, translation. It's Zabrinie Małopolskie, which is, Mal Małopolskie is like lesser Poland. So it's just before the Carpathians that border Ukraine. Um, but when I got older, you know, I asked her, I said, you know, I, I really feel called to to use this. And, and she smiled and that's when she kind of, you know, she brought me to the picture of Mary. And, mm. you know, I'm, and of course, at the time, you know, I'm 17 turning 18. She's, you know, 100 years old. And, you know, we're conversing. And, and of course, there's, there's such a gap in culture. Um, and I mean, she was born in 1903. So the world is, is a very different place yeah. now. And so she's trying to explain to me these concepts, and I'm hanging on every word. And she just looked at Mary, and she said, this is who we pray to. Mm. This is who tells me. And, you know, I'm thinking I'm intellectualizing it. I'd heard, you know, my whole life we're Polish. You know, Mary uh, Mary is the queen of Poland. She's a patron saint of Poland. So I'm thinking, okay, it's because we're Polish. And then she goes, she said something to me in Polish that she made me write down. And she said, I'm going to tell you who I am and who you are. And I was like, okay. And she's like, get your paper ready. And she goes, and I'll say it in Polish because it won't really make sense. She said, ja jestem szeptucha. <laughs> and I said, I am what? You are what? And I am what? And she said, Sheptuha. And I'd never heard this term. And she said, Whisperer. Hmm. And I said, Well, what, what do you mean, Whisperer? And she goes, Well, my great grandmother was from a region called Podlashe. And Mary came and taught us how to use the plants. And, you know, all the women in this, certain women who have been sick or have had these life events they had the gift of being a Sheptuha and people would come to us and it was our agreement that we would heal others and the plants would whisper to us. So I'm thinking, you know, this intellectual, okay, we're an agrarian society. And it actually wasn't until last year when, funny enough, when I went through a bit of a healing crisis of my own, I decided to defer my naturopathic studies and pursue my master's for a year to give my body time. I was speaking to a woman in Polish and she said, oh yeah, my great grandmother was a Sheptuha. And I went, I was stunned. I was like, here's this word surfacing. And my mm. grandmother made me write it down numerous times, repeat it. And I said, what do you mean? And she goes, you know, Kara, Poland isn't as isolated as it used to be. You really need to look this up. And she ended up sending me links. And what I found out is that my grandmother was actually a folk healer and that mm. this is a, a, a dying folk tradition that is only passed on. And when it's passed on, the individual in the family who pass it on, passes it on dies. And this was two weeks before she had died. Oh, wow. So it's like she had passed the baton. Um, and so I feel like that was just one of those gifts and one of those affirmations where she said, like, keep going, you mm. know, continue to heal yourself. 
you know, first, cause she always taught me that she had been through, you know, she was a breast cancer survivor who did it all naturally. Um, you know, she was a very strong, resilient woman had been through wars, you know, really terrible things, but she always focused on what she could do healing herself and then she could heal others. And so I really took that message to heart, but it, it really strengthened and really reaffirmed for me the teaching that I had, that it really was something that I could share. And it wasn't just something that, you know, that I, that I was loving because of my, my love of my Prabhupada. Was your mom or grandma healers in any ways as well? Um, yeah. So on, so my family, so I'm actually a mixed ancestry. So okay. on the other side of my family, um, I don't know if anyone has, or maybe you have heard of uh, the midwife of the Dion quintuplets. Mm -mm. So it's a very famous birth here in Canada where, um, French Canadian midwives, so I'm part French Canadian, um, and Algonquin. And, um, they had attended a woman named Miss Dion. And, um, back then, you know, midwives were like the country folk healers, doctors, uh, again, this is in 1930s. Um, and, um, the one midwife used to be a nurse. So she worked very closely with a doctor named Dr. Defoe. Um, mm -hmm. but not having as much experience, she called my great, great grandmother over to help with the birth. And it ended up being five babies that were born that were never supposed to survive. And so she became a very, very famous midwife. Um, so yeah, so we have folk healers and, and I, and I have her diary and she actually was like the town doctor because, you know, doctors would have to travel two, three hours. So if there was a farm accident, if there is anything, you know, this is, this is who they would go see. And so all of these things were passed down in our family and it was passed down through the women. Interestingly enough, it was just this like vocation and, and no one was really into, there was always, there's always one person in each generation that's really interested that passes it along. Mm -hmm. So I'll be interested to see out of my four children who is, who is, who I'm going to pass the baton to. <laughs> Are there any inklings right now who it might be? Um, I think my oldest, actually, she was born in El Salvador and okay. um, I was working with traditional midwives in oh. that, um, like in that area. And um, I remember someone telling me saying, you know, this is a very special baby. And of course, she mm. almost died at birth. Very similar story, wow. um, which, you know, in my family, they say, you know, people who have walked through these health challenges, they have that special capacity to understand you know, what it's like to have to work towards healing and, and really appreciate, you know, these mod that it's not just modalities, that there's an actual exchange and, and um, commitment that we have to healing others. And she's very sensitive. And, uh, you know, she says she's going to go, you know, back to El Salvador. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's going to work as a healer. That's her plan. As soon as she's 18, she's 16 now. And she's ask. so <laughs> have you been back to Poland? I have not like I'm oh. going um I'm going to be taking my children in 2 years. Wow. I'm That's going to be epic, here. I bet. Yeah, they're they're um I'm connecting right now with some uh contacts that I have to mm -hmm. try to um to try to really like connect with some of the Sheptuha or the Sheptuhi that are there um because a lot of them what they're finding is that the folk healers are passing on and no one wants to learn this. Okay. Um, you know, it's very well respected, but it's also very well, um, forgotten about with the medicalization. People usually go for a last resort. They're almost, they're uncertain of it because in like Orthodox, um, kind of Russian Orthodox, because in Podlashe, for those who aren't really familiar with the history, it's like a mix of Belarusians and Ukrainians. And like the borders changed a lot in Poland for people who don't know the history, right? Yeah. Um, so it's very much almost like a melting pot. So a lot of the, the traditions are more of like the Russian Orthodox almost. Mm. Um, so for, you know, someone who's, it's predominantly Roman Catholic, it's a little bit terrifying. So people will talk about, you know, going and seeing these folk healers, being terrified out of their mind and then coming out and, and feeling amazing and going, I don't know quite what happened, but this is incredible. Um, but because of that apprehension about it, it's, it's not as well preserved. So I think there's also like a cultural shift in trying to preserve these traditions. 
So yeah. Yeah. So I'm very excited about my children haven't been to Poland and uh, they go to Polish school every day. So they're, they're, oh, wow. they're working hard. <laughs> Does that mean they're learning the language too? They are learning the language. Yes. It's just awesome. a couple hours and then, you know, they go Saturdays and go to complete Polish school and then um, try to, to learn as much as they can about the culture, which you know, herbal medicine is so embedded in a lot of the, um, you know, celebrations and feast days. And um, so I think they're, they're, they're kind of getting, okay, my mom's not just some crazy woman with all the herbal <laughs> that at hand, like the, this is in her. <laughs> you mentioned feast days. I'm curious what your kitchen is like, like, are there um, traditional meals uh, based on Polish cooking that you're doing um, or inspired by Anna? Just a quick break from the show to let you know about the Herb Rally events page. Did you know that we add new herbalism events from all over the United States and the world for that matter on an almost daily basis? You can peruse herbalism events at herbrally.com slash events and hopefully find something in your neck of the woods. You can also search by state to make it even easier to find a plant walk, conference, or class near you. And we also list virtual herbalism events as well. Check those out at herbrally.com slash virtual. And again, for the in-person events, go to herbrally.com slash events. All right, back to the show. Yeah, so continually, I mean, uh, obviously everyone knows pierogi. Um, oh, yeah. Wamki, which is cabbage rolls, you know, we make that. Um, but yeah, there, there's quite a lot. Like in my family, we, um, especially what what tradition we brought over the men um they make and even my great grandmother did as well they make kielbasa which is like a smoked mm. sausage um and so a lot of that um we eat but um you know believe it or not like my great grandmother she didn't actually eat a lot of meat like people associate poland with a lot of like meat and rich foods and rich pastries the Polish peasants, because my family were peasants, right, from small villages, they were farmers, they really didn't, um, they didn't really have access to a lot of meat. And being Roman Catholic, it was a very simple, bland diet, like kasha, grains, mm. um, you know, vegetables, root vegetables. So we tend to eat a lot of like that, like ancestrally, and a lot less more of the like, pierogi and you know more richer dishes so definitely like tonight is fat thursday so it's before <laughs> lent um mm, right. you know um so we're going to be eating our ponchki which are the polish donuts so we're very very excited about that so we might have to break out the stretchy pants so <laughs> <laughs> totally. and my dad's coming down for that because you can't oh. miss it right it's like That'll a big be awesome. family yeah so there's there's a lot of gatherings a lot of food and food is really like a key for nourishing ourselves. So as much as you see all the rich foods, it's a lot of soups. It's a lot of bone broths. It's a lot of like what you would find in health foods, like a lot of the ancestral healing foods, right? That's um, very whole foods based, unlike the very commercialized, you know, pierogi with a bunch of sour cream and fried, like those are fun. And I mean, they are a traditional food, but it's not like you wouldn't see me eating pierogi every day. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. How about like a traditional ferments? Are there like um, Polish? Yeah. 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 So yeah, we do like a sauerkraut. We mm. do um, like, um, and we do different versions. Like we use a lot of beets and that. And then there's like lacto fermented pickles mm. that we love. Like I have like a big massive crock that we use. And like my grandmother, great grandmother, even my grandparents. It's funny when they came to Canada, they all moved at the same time. Um, my grandparents had a farm and then when my great, well, my great grandparents had a farm. And then when my great grandfather passed away, my grandfather took part of his land and built my great grandmother, a house next door, very typical Polish thing to do. Um, so growing up, I just go back and forth between their homes and, you know, it'd be like, go over to great grandma's and she'd have this big, massive stone crock with this board and this huge stone. And you'd be picking out these lacto fermented pickles for dinner. Um, so yeah, pickling was huge and, you know, my, my family is huge into canning. Um, I still do it and, you know, I pass it on to my children begrudgingly for some, of them. um, <laughs> they'll grow to appreciate it. <laughs> they will, they will. Like, especially when we're doing the big, like, okay, it's planting season, it's planting season. We're working in like the greenhouses and stuff. They're just like, oh, why can't we just be like a, sometimes I wish we could just be like a normal family that lived in a condo mom. And I'm like, <laughs> 
you don't think that right now, but when you yeah. get older, you'll thank me. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, you know, just, and especially for me, like I had a dual denal atresia, right? So I had a bowel obstruction when I was in mm. utero. It was from, my mother was a stained glass artist. Oh, so wow. they didn't really know about lead um, at the time. So it was a common birth defect. Uh, she had been working heavy with lead. Mm. Um, so, you know, for me, having been compromised, like through the digestive tract and through, you know, all the multiple surgeries I had when I was younger, gut health has been a huge focus, but I've never really had to focus on it because, you know, we've even cor incorporated things like kefir and, and, and things like that. And, yep. you know, when people say to me, take probiotics, I'm like, I, I think I'm pretty good. And yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Much cheaper than a pill too. Exactly. And, you know, I, I get like certain strains in that, especially for people who like IBS, but usually you can find them in the wild ferments. I find it's just more and it's and it's more suited to your ecosystem, right? Like what are the bacteria around you? You're also handling these things. You're interacting with it. And I think that in terms of healing, when you as opposed to a manufactured product, I mean, I, I, they are useful. But if you have the capacity to interact, I feel like you know, that exchange, that microbiome exchange, you, you just, you, you can't compare the two, right? And it's in your immediate environment. So it's giving you the things that you need to thrive. Absolutely. Do you have any uh, recommended like Polish cookbooks or even like Polish herbal books? Yeah. So I actually have like a whole, whole list of them okay. um, that I had put on my, my Instagram. So there is this one, now a lot of them are in are in Polish. So if you can't speak Polish, it's a okay. little bit tricky. Um, but Susanna Sack actually just did Slavic Kitchen Alchemy, which for English speakers is really great. Um, Sophie Hodorovich Nab, um, she actually has a bunch of beautiful books in English. She is um Polish. Her her parents were, you know, very much like my family, where, you know, they were displaced, they were forced laborers during World War II. Um, so she was actually born in a labor camp in Germany or a displaced persons camp in Germany. Germany after the war. And so she's really um, stayed very connected to the folk, folk, you know, believes the folk um, um, superstitions, the folk herbalism. So she has a beautiful one about um, Polish uh, flowers, herbs, and then she even has a lot of the traditions that she's mm -hmm. written about. So it's, it's really, really wonderful um, books that you can dig in to learn a lot more about it. Um, I'm just thinking of the other ones that are out there. There are even like Russian ones, there's Ukrainian, like um, Ukrainian and Polish, like we, there's a lot of interchange and exchange between them, you know, with the changing borders. So there's Baba's Kitchen um, Remedies. Um, and there's another book um, that's just about, it's called The Word and the Wax. And it's a little bit about um, kind of like the diaspora, someone who would be like Ukrainian Canadian um, mm -hmm. from the settlers in Saskatchewan. That's actually where my family originally went was Saskatchewan. Um, and then they moved to Toronto because it was densely populated with uh, a lot of Poles. Um, oh. But a lot of um, Eastern Europeans settled in Saskatchewan. And so they almost had their own um, approach to folk healing and folk medicine. And so it's a beautiful little, it's almost done like, like as an ethnographic study, um, mm -hmm. but it contains the word in the wax kind of has like, it has prayers. It, it's probably the most comprehensive source on kind of Eastern European folk healing in English, because that's the barrier. If you're not fluent in the language, it's it's hard to find resources. And then of course, with the wars, you know, even those who can speak the language, some of the the sources I go back to are like 18, 1900s, because there was oh, such wow. a, a displacement of culture and, you know, loss of of what are really beautiful traditions. So that's why, you know, I hold my Prabhupada's capacity to retain that and still, you know, not let all of the things that she had you know, experienced in her lifetime, dampen her love of who she was and, mm -hmm. you know, the beautiful folk healing and, and medicines that have cared for our family for centuries. I mean, this is a woman who lived before antibiotics. So, you know, to her, it was like, well, this is, this is medicine. You know, it wasn't just, Hey, you know, I really like this. And, you know, some people go, Oh, you know, it works. Okay. Like, she's like, no, like she's seen it actually, you know, be come down to life or death 
and, you know, a plant really bring that person back in a way that, you know, obviously for legal and ethical reasons, we, we can't practice that way anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Herbs work. Uh, you mentioned the, the resources list on your Instagram account and I'll say for yeah. the listener, that's, uh, at the herb filled homestead. Um, and if I remember, I will try to leave a link to that actual resources list in the podcast show notes. Um, but I'll definitely link to your Instagram page. Um, lots of info there. Um, I've seen you write on your Instagram page uh, about the doctrine of signatures a couple mm-hmm. times at least. And I was just kind of curious what your take on the doctrine of signatures is. And if there's any, um, if Polish herbalism kind of recognizes that as well. Yeah, well, I mean, everyone, like for those who know, you think of Jacob Bohm, you know, he wrote the book about the doctrine of signatures and how, you know, God really gave us these, you know, or whatever force, because I understand not everyone has, you know, a religious background, but that essentially these things were created um, for our use and how we could, you know, utilize them is based on on their description, right, on their physical description or the way they smell or the way they taste. Um, And I do think that... Um, when I look in the old pharmacopoeias, it definitely does, um, you know, they definitely utilize their own version of it. And I think if anything, we can, we can take it out of a a religious context, um, the doctrine of signatures. And I think we can just really look at the relationship that we establish with a plant, right? There's certain qualities that it imbues. Um, and, you know, based on our experiences, we may see different, you like, purposes and utilizations with it because I mean we're we're unique organisms so we're going to experience these plants differently because our organisms and our constitutions are different but um you know I just recently posted in terms of how in Polish herbalism um you know bez czerny, which is you know our black elderberry right like our mm-hmm. elderberry because there's white elderberry there's different types of elderberries um And so, you know, you have, you have your, your elderberry and they believed that, you know, it, it had a, it had a, like this, this malevolent spirit that lived underneath it, that would collect all of the disease and all of the sickness. And that's what gave it its power. It was something beautiful and healing and protective um, because it kept kind of in prison, this evil spirit that would just take all of the sickness and the illness. Um, and they said just the way that it like branches out and it's almost, you know, if you look at elderberry and I mean, I have like obviously eight or 10 of them, it kind of grows, you know, where it's almost like the small little dwelling where like den, I've had foxes den in my elderberry bushes before. So I can kind of see how they see that. And they were so, they revered it so much because it was such an important plant that they saw it as, you know, containing essentially all evil. And so Mm. from just the shape of the way that it grew, they saw that kind of doctrine of signatures of what it does that takes sickness and, you know, the way that you sweat out those impurities, right? Um, They saw that reflected where it's because back then illness had a lot to do with there's a lot of talk of like witchcraft and evil spirits but you know there was good um there was good you know there were healers there that you know anything that was witchcraft was just what they couldn't understand it wasn't just that they were saying oh this is witches and it's evil it's more like there are malevolent spirits and and that's what illness was to them so um, yeah, so the older doctrine of signatures definitely goes into that. And it's it's just really intriguing. So I always dig through the mythology and my grandmother would tell me like lots of little stories about, you know, Polish and Eastern European mythology, especially Baba Yaga. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you look at the the um, dragon, I don't know if you've ever heard of Wawel Castle, there's mm-hmm. a dragon smock. Um, that lives underneath and it protects the area. It's, it's, it's really interesting. They, they kind of persona, like they give like a personification to nature. So it, as far as doctrine of signatures, it's more of the kind of mythology and, and the superstition surrounding a plant. Fascinating. Yeah. I remember the first time when I, when I first started getting into herbalism and I heard about the doctrine of signatures, I saw a picture of, I want to say it was the Garana seed. And uh, it looks like just buggy eyeballs. Have you seen these before? No, I haven't. I'm gonna. I have was to like, that. yeah, I, I kind of want to look that up right now. Maybe I'll leave a <laughs> link in the or a, an image in the video version of this. But um, 
Is this right? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. It's guarana seed, and um, they just look like big buggy eyeballs, and you know, it's like hyper stimulating. So, uh, anyways, yeah, it's just fascinating, and I, I loved hearing your perspective on that. But um, why don't we um talk a little bit about your herbal education? I've always been kind of fascinated by what is his name? Uh, Terry Willard is that mm -hmm. is that his name? And it, it looks yeah. to me as if you studied. I'm not sure if it was the online version or not, but at the Wild Rose College. Uh, I want to yeah. say they're based in Ontario. Can you tell us a little bit about like who your mentors have been, your herbal education and all that? Yeah. So I actually started studying at Living Earth School of Herbalism. Um, before I began any sort of traditional studies, though, I should backtrack. During my midwifery apprenticeship in Guatemala, um, where I studied with Indigenous midwives, because I was a, a midwife before all of this. Um, wow. <laughs> I actually, uh, was very, they taught me a lot about the local use of herbs because herbs and birth, just like in Poland are very much for the indigenous cultures. You know, it, it's again, it's just, it's just so embedded in how we care for each other. So I would say the two years that I spent there, you know, apprenticing, that's where I, I got a lot of my herbal foundations aside from what was really enriched uh, in my childhood. Um, I had a, a mentor named, um, her Christian name was Marielos, and, and that's that's who really taught me a lot about the use of, of herbs and childbirth and um, just different healing modalities such as massage and and um, what we would consider almost like a sauna, but they, mm. they call it something totally different. Um, and so that was my first real I think living in, because I lived in Central America for, you know, quite a number of years. I speak Spanish fluently. Um, Trilingual. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, my Spanish is actually even better than my Polish now. Like wow. I speak it, it's actually probably better than my English, to be honest. Wow. Um, but yeah, so I, um, so that was really where the foundation and, and it was really great living there because I had really taken, I loved everything and I cherished the teachings that my Prabhupada had given me. And of course, um, you know, growing up, I, I was essentially trained by my um, MD, uh, who was Dr. Werner Fabian, who is an anthrosophic physician. Um, so he's one of five physicians in Canada and anthrosopic medicine comes from, uh, Dr. Rudolf Steiner, um, mm -hmm. who, you know, it's that understanding of the patient provider, uh, therapeutic relationship, that dynamic that they collaborate together for the health goals and that it's patient driven care. And it's not really patient. They don't like that word, but I'm using it just to kind of ease you into it. It's more of honoring an individual and walking them alongside on their journey. And that what, what word do they use instead of patient out of curiosity? Um, they just kind of talk about like, I'm trying to think of in the book and he was trying to explain it to me because my physician explained it to me. He used German. So I'm, mm. he used the German term and I cannot remember it. My German is terrible. <laughs> I have too many languages <laughs> in my head. Yeah. Um, but essentially they just, they see you just as an individual. Like there isn't gotcha. actually a term. It's like, this is the individual sitting before you awesome. and you would just refer them as a name. And it's really, you know, redistributing. It's kind of what we do in herbalism anyways, you know, redistributing that power dynamic of saying like, these are your autonomous decisions to make. And my role is to give you information and we'll kind of walk alongside of each other. Yeah. So I grew up with that model my whole life instead of going to see a specialist because he was an MD. He was from Germany, but he never once prescribed me a pharmaceutical. He did all homeopathy and herbs and diet. That was it. And his first thing he said to me when I was a child is, by the time I'm done with you, you will not need me. That is my goal. So I would say between him and my Prabhupada, that was a really great reinforcement. But I I didn't know outside of myself, like, how do we apply this to other people? Because it's such an intimate journey and such an intimate relationship. So then, you know, I go to, to Central America and, you know, I sit there and I go, wow, like, you can really use it for other people. Like, not everybody has this training or this experience. So I came, uh, did a small, you know, bunch of courses from midwives when I became a midwife, like I studied midwifery in the United States, um, in Michigan, actually. Oh. Um, yeah. And studied at ancient art midwifery Institute mm -hmm. there. Um, and, you know, worked with home birth midwives there and, um, really got to when they passed legislation in the state of Michigan, it was really like, okay, do you get your full CPM? 
um, and, you know, work as a CPM, which I'm sure you know what it is. Um, I don't actually. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's a certified professional midwife. So there's that's gotcha. a, okay. a hospital midwife, right? So you're yeah. home midwife. You're not like a CNN, a, cert, a certified nurse midwife. Gotcha. Um, so then I started studying at the Living Earth School of Herbalism uh, with Michael Bertoli. I don't know if you know of him. Incredibly. I actually don't. I don't know that herbalist. Yeah. So he just spoke on a panel at... Um, at the Canadian Herb Conference. So oh, he okay. was like very involved in Ontario Herbalist Association. So I did like tons of online courses through him. Um, awesome. You know, he has in-person workshops that I tried to make it, but was, you know, managing a health food store when I quit working in midwifery. And then, yeah, just transitioned to Wild Rose and I'm just finishing well, I do all my education outside of herbalism, uh, finishing my master herbalism to be able to have that like official shingle of I'm a registered herbalist. That's awesome. Yeah. So you're you're referring to you're also studying naturopathy right now, correct? Yeah. Well, yeah. So I got my um, I had to get my health sciences and psychology degree from Queens. So I finished that in record timing. Went to <laughs> naturopathy. Yeah, I did a I literal did a, literal record timing. Yeah, I did it in two years. <laughs> Back to wow. back to back to back to back. I had literally like accounted it maybe 30 days off in a year. Wow. So what would take someone four years to do, I did in two. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's so it was absurd. pretty crazy, but I was pretty yeah. driven. And then I started at Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine last January, um, yeah. kind of wrapped up my semester because again, you know, I was hit with a healing crisis in my body. And I think it was just, you know, I think when you put so much intense focus and study, you can kind of drift away from the practices you need to, you know, that you know that you need to do, you know, as much as we say like, oh, you know, take time for yourself, care providers can have that tendency to care for everyone else except themselves, which is a really hard lesson I've had to learn a few times over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it hit me. So I was facing a potential surgery. So I deferred and I'm actually finishing my master's of health sciences at Western University right now. Um, what really prompted my thinking to defer and do that was, I don't know if um, you've heard of the bill C47 that's passed here in Canada? No. So yeah, so Canada is actually facing, um, you have like for, for the United States, my understanding is that you have the Food and Drug Administration, right? For okay. herbal medicines, right? And you just can't make any medical claims. Is that correct? That's very true. Yep. Okay. So what we have here in Canada, we actually have one of the strictest systems already in place where, you know, there's, there. It was in our Food and Drug Act, uh, very similar, where you can't make any medical claims. If you're a practitioner, you can compound. Um, you just can't make any medical claims. But for companies, if they really want to make medical claims, they can get they can sell licensed herbal products. What they have a natural drug, like a, a natural like product number an NPM, sorry, um, which is a natural, natural product number where they can make certain claims that align with either traditional um, herbal uses, or they can have, um, they can actually like make some sort of research backed scientific claim. That's actually very similar to how it is here as well. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now what they're doing though, is our government has slipped in a budget bill. So for years, they've been trying to control herbal medicines as if they're pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. So only pharmaceutical companies can manufacture them. You have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. You have to have the whole third party testing. So this has been like a 20 year battle. Terry Willard from Wild Rose Herbal College has been, you know, forefront of this. Hero Willard, all of them. Um, and, you know, the Canadian Health Food Association constantly fighting back. You know, I used to work in a health food store. Same thing. We'd be doing petitions. Well, what our government decided to do is they stuck it in a budget bill. And it was just two lines that basically gave Health Canada sweeping power to remove products that they deem without any sort of review or concern and that they would be uh, regulated just like pharmaceuticals, which means people like myself, unless I'm a licensed provider, I cannot, like I would need to be a naturopathic doctor to be able to prescribe them. But it's become so costly that we are at the risk of all of the companies pulling out because a lot of these small Canadian businesses, people like myself would never be able to, we, we still have compounding laws, but that can change. You know, I would only be able to give someone something 
if they came to me as an herbalist. And even then, it's very gray matter that we would be working in. Um, so there's a huge, huge challenge right now where it's passed. It's going to go through the 2025, but we're pushing back. And there's been like a massive response. So kind of when that happened, I thought, you know what, I'm going to get my master's. So then that way I can do naturopathic medical research where mm. I can research these compounds. So I'm done in uh, the end of July. I'm in my second semester. I have one more to go and I'm, you know, doing research and projects. And that's really the way I wanted to position myself before going back in September. That was really um, for me, you know, I want to play a pivotal role in protecting the traditional uses, because if this bill marches forward, we can no longer rely on traditional uses. It will be if it's not backed and they're going to the problem is they're going to test them just like pharmaceuticals. And we know that, yes, they have chemical constituents, but you can't isolate, you know, an extract from a plant because we don't even understand the synergistic relationship of the other constituents within that plant, right? That that whole plant approach. Um, so we know that a lot of the traditional uses will be eradicated just from the manhandling and, and the misuse of it. And I could kind of see it, the writing in, on the wall when I was in my undergrad, because I, I took a lot of pharmacology um, in my degree, just, just to understand and, and have that, you know, understanding of, of drug herb interactions. And, you know, if you even look at the definition of what a drug is, and they made us do a whole unit on natural medicines, um, with kind of that underlying message message of people aren't safe, because this is not standardized, things need to be standardized to be safe. It's that whole concept of, of risk versus reward. Um, they actually define a drug as anything consumed by um, your consumed outside of nutritive purposes that exerts a bio like a, a biological physiological response within the biological organism so you can see how herbs really fit into that and so yeah. a lot of this lobbying is the pharmaceutical companies um, and the medical associations who really want to limit and restrict so um, I thought, you know, getting my master's sounded really, really good as much as I was very sad to step away from from naturopathic medicine. But yeah, I will be again in September. Very excited about it. <laughs> you will be what again? Oh, going back to naturopathic medical school. Sorry. Gotcha. OK, yeah. no, no worries. Yeah. Um, that's that's all very scary. Um, I don't like the sound of that. Are you um, optimistic that positive changes are coming or are you just scared? And that's what like why you said you're going to become a naturopath. Um, well, no, like I had always wanted to become an ND just because mm -hmm. I can use a lot of the skills and training and sure. like reading labs that, you know, people kind I think for people, it's like bringing them over. Like, I've always had a very spiritual focus and very like, sure. natural, holistic understanding. But I think for a lot of I get a lot of clients who come from kind of the allopathic realm that they need some like hand holding to totally. say, okay, we'll look at your labs, give them those reassurance. And they are useful in more advanced cases, right? To yeah. get some lab values and have some lab testing. So it wasn't really the fear that's pushing me to become a naturopathic doctor. It was more the, you know, I want to protect not only from my love and my own personal um, experience of these compounds and like, you know, of, of plant medicine and botanical medicines, but just, you know, wanting to preserve it, um, you know, because it is valid, there are valid uses for it. And I think, you know, if we also from a health equity stance, we're going to be eradicating what is not only a cultural component for many people, but the most accessible form of health care. Mm. Um, that is available to people. So really, my thinking was to be cut, you know, get that researcher background with my Master's of Health Sciences so that, you know, when I go back to the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, while I'm doing my, you know, ND schooling, it's like, I'm working at the Robert Shad Naturopathic Clinic conducting research that's going to be used as ammunition. Um, as far as my feelings, I think it's very hard to tell. Um you know, a lot of things I have to say, the Canada that I knew and grew up in, it's, 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 there's a lot of political things happening that I try to tiptoe around when I speak. It's sure. very hard because it's become very unpredictable. I think if anything, I can say, I feel optimistic because so many people like the MPs and the MPPs, which is like kind of our congressmen here in mm. Canada, um, they have been inundated with letters. Like it, there are political parties fighting on our behalf to not have this happen. But 
you know, essentially this bill has already passed, you know, they gave such a small window to collect feedback from the public. So it's, it's, it's really hard to say, you know, I think just the, and I think you can appreciate it being in the United States. Like it's just, I think all around, it's just a very kind of politically charged climate that you just don't know how, how it all is going to pan out. So you hope for the best. I'm an optimist. So I hope for the best. Same. Yeah. I, I don't have any answers. That's for sure. But yeah, dear listener, if you're listening to this on YouTube, I'd be uh, very curious your thoughts. Please leave, uh, please leave them in the comments below. Um, well, why don't we transition a little bit? Um, I would like to hear more about the herb filled homestead and what y'all offer there. Oh, before we do that, I want to say a shout out to uh, uh, Lake Ole Leilani, Lake Ole Leilani for joining us live here, uh, Herb Rally Schoolhouse member. Um, but yeah, what what are y'all doing over at the Herb Field Homestead? What kind of services do you, do you offer? Yeah, so Herb Field Homestead, that's kind of, that's our home for, for uh, to get started. But no, we live on um, three acres in a small farming community called um, Ilderton. And, okay. um, you know, it used to be a dairy farm behind us is 85 acres, but we lived on three, we live on three um, severed acres. And um, essentially what we are is kind of like a biodynamic regenerative herb farm on a small scale right now, because both my husband and I are in school with four children because we're crazy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I, I started it. It's my fault. Like just before the yeah. onset of the craziness of the past few years, I just felt this calling of, okay, I'm, I'm going to go to school here in Canada and, you know, I'll actually get some titles for what it is that I'm doing. Right. He's also um, in the medical field to some degree, right? Yeah. Healing, yeah. He, yeah. Yeah, he works in he worked in neurological rehabilitation. So he's a kinesiologist. Oh. Um, so he worked with people that like, you know, in physiotherapy settings, you know, people who've had strokes, motor vehicle collisions. But that's like when you are someone who is, you know, he happens to come. It's it's not surprising that we're together because he comes from a very long line of healers, too. Like we're so just cool. Yeah, we're just like those sensitive souls that have just come to this earth to make it a better place, right? And we it. recognize that instantly. That was kind of like our connection. Um, but yeah, he was working in it and he was just feeling so distraught of seeing people who were, you know, going through insurance companies, you know, they had paid everything and then being denied. And he mm -hmm. just felt it was such a heavy weight. And he just looked at me and he said, you know, I almost feel like I'm part of the problem. Um, you know, cause I'm, I'm supporting this and he's like, I really feel like my passion and, you know, everything he's like, it's hurting me who yeah. I am and, and the purpose I have. So he's actually, he's still working in neurological rehabilitation, but now he's working more so in a private clinic where, you know, people don't have the constraints of, um, being approved by our healthcare system or insurance. It's people just, you know, able to fund it as they can. So he's really enjoying that, but he's actually come March in 18 months, he will be an osteopath. So, um, awesome. he's like, yeah, he, he is absolutely amazing when it comes to like body mechanics and, um, you know, just, just, you know, the whole osteopathic principles of opening up drainage. And I think, you know, when you use something like herbalism, you can really, um, create outcomes that you never thought were possible. So he also does cranial sacral therapy. So he does that here at the house. You know, we have all of the herbs that we offer, you know, we, we sell bulk herbs to other, you know, local herbalists in our area. Um, we hold classes and, you know, we have, you know, I think it's about an acre that we grow everything on, but we're hoping to expand once, once we're done school and we're not raising, you know, four kids and going through such intense school. Um, but that's what we offer. And then, you know, I do herbalism consults and, you know, I have my small practice that tends to really focus on, you know, like residual stored trauma, people who've been through really hard, hard medical things, because I understand that space. And then my husband kind of works on, you know, people coming out of, you know, being passed through the system, they've hit a wall, you know, with their insurance benefits, and he's there to kind of do the body work. He, he's kind of my right hand, because he can do the things I can vice versa. So for the dynamic duo. <laughs> You're a great team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You said, uh, he's going to be an osteopath. Is that what, um, 
here in the States, I guess, is that a DO? Do you call that a DO? No, well, in Canada, we actually don't have legislation. So it's kind of nice because it's kind of like herbalism where there's no regulations. They're not a regulated healthcare provider where okay. as a naturopathic doctor, I will be regulated and I will be licensed. Uh, they are considered manual osteopathic practitioners, which I should have said to begin with, because there is, there is a distinction. They're trained very similarly. Like his curriculum at his school is no different, mm -hmm. except for them, they really don't, they shy away from, they learn about pharmaceuticals, but they're like, if you're doing your job right, you shouldn't need them. So they, yeah. they don't really bring in that allopathic. They wouldn't work in the hospital. It would just be more of let's look at drainage and opening pathways and looking at the way alignment, you know, can really help bring the body back into that balance, right? Especially after something so traumatic as like a car accident, or even our sedentary lifestyles, you know, sitting here typing for hours, my, <laughs> my husband constantly looks at me and he's like, fixing me and going, stop this. You're reducing your lifespan. Like your <laughs> system is screaming at me right now. Um, so it is very different. And he did that purposely because he really, um, you know, as, as good as regulation can be, you know, they're just like regulating herbalism. You know, there, there's a lot of talk on both sides, but I can see the, the merit in maintaining, you know, its original principles and not regulating it and make, because it makes it so much more accessible to mm. people. I believe. Yeah, I just got a new doctor here in Appleton, Wisconsin, and, and he's a DO, which I was, I never heard of that before. I had to look it up. So I, I want to say he's a doctor of osteopathy, yes. um, if I'm recalling correctly. But yeah, it was, um, I really like him. And um, so that's, that's pretty cool that your husband's pursuing that path. Um, awesome. Well, thanks for sharing about the uh, herb filled homestead. I was curious what you don't have to say like any figures or anything, but is selling tinctures like a large portion of the business that you do? You know what? Honestly, it is. And I really? find, yeah, like tinctures, people just really, I think because it's so much more accessible, um, it's easier because, you know, you just put it in a bit of water. But what I find um, the biggest sellers for me um, is actually glycerin, like glycerides. Um, yeah. Especially for people who avoid alcohol, people who have concerns about it. You know, there's some people who can't metabolize alcohol actually have like an allergy to it. Um, so I find even a lot of practitioners, I'm making more and more non-alcoholic tinctures for them. Um, but cool. really what I'd love to kind of shift is to more, you know, teaching this so that people can take these skills and, and bring it back into their communities just mm. to support my local community. You know, I, I think the skill share is what I'm most passionate about. But I mean, anyone who is Polish laughs that people buy them from me because it's that's just part of the culture. Like you tincture everything. <laughs> right. You fruit. Let's make a vodka with cran. Yeah. Let's, you know, the vodka cranberry or we do raspberry or strawberry. Like we tincture everything. So it's just I guess, you know, people think it's a lot more complicated than it is. So. Right. <laughs> Just soaking some herbs and some alcohol. I'm no, no it's yeah. a little I, more... I call it lazy herbalism. It's <laughs> yeah, <perfect>. totally. <laughs> I love that. Well, uh, you recently posted about um a red clover tincture. I want to say that was a recent post uh on your Instagram account. And um I just thought that might be a fun thing to talk about because you're saying, well, spring is around the corner and you're excited to see the the red clover blossoms popping up here soon. And uh, I was just kind of thinking you could teach the audience a little bit about your love for red clover. Any other upcoming spring plants that you're excited uh, to see? Yeah, well, I guess um, starting with red clover, I, I really love it. Like a lot of there's a lot of debate about it. It's mm -hmm. actually kind of a little bit of a controversial figure um, because it's it contains like those phytoestrogens. And mm -hmm. so with, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of misconception and that's why I love bringing up this herb. Not only is it one, you know, just driving down my dirt roads that I live on, um, which is pretty cool. I love that I live on dirt roads because I grew <laughs> up on a dirt road. Um, you know, you just see it popping all along, along the, the roadside. And it's one of the first ones that I'm like, okay, spring is here. It's, you know, along with the dandelion, right? Um, but a lot of people with the enhanced awareness of kind of xenoestrogens, right? Those synthetic forms of estrogen that comes from like fluoride and, um, you know, different 
um, chemicals in that and just the way that they disrupt our endocrine system. Um, you know, a lot of people hear phytoestrogens and they go, oh no, like estrogenic sources are terrible. So I have a lot of people like stay away from red clover, you know, it's going to give you cancer, especially for women, it's going to cause, you know, hormonal imbalances. But if anything, it's the opposite. Like I see it as such a, especially for like, for someone like myself, I'm dating myself, you know, I'm 40, but like hitting that perimenopause, it is such a beautiful plant ally to help you through that transition. Um, because because it's it's just so cardio protective. It has um, you know some isoflavones. Flav- I'm thinking in another language. <laughs> isoflavones that are you know really really protective of that like bone density, right? Um, as women age, their bone density decreases. It's from that sudden drop of estrogen, and so what we find is that you know where men have heart attacks you know, earlier in life, women have it later when there's that sudden decrease of estrogen. So what, you know, red clover is really great for is not only, you know, um, and there's all this talk about bioidentical hormones, which are pretty much the same thing as hormone replacement therapy, you know, women can kind of, you know, add that in as long as they don't have any contraindications to help maintain that bone density, help maintain, you know, ensure that vitamin D is, is brought into that um, matrix of the bones, um, but also having that sufficient supply because phytoestrogens are absorbed into the body, but they're not it's seen as estrogen, but it's not like taking a birth control, which is, I think that's the common misconception. They're saying like, it's like this huge high dose of, you know, hormone replacement therapy, which causes stroke in women, which causes where this doesn't have it. It's just so natural. Like it, like it, it, it comes into your body and it almost works in an adaptogenic sense hmm. from what I've seen from pulling labs, like using it in a clinical, you know, sense with women. Um, so it just kind of supports those levels uh, in a way that something like Vitex couldn't. Um, because it's not just balancing, it's get, how can you balance something that you don't have? So it's really great for, um, you know, filling in those gaps when your estrogen levels start to dip. It kind of gives you that little bit to help you get through that that phase um, in a much more gentle way. And it's, and, you know, just um, it's anti-inflammatory properties, which are really looked over, which I think that people do not realize how much that has an effect on, you know, your autonomic nervous system. And especially for things like cancer, right? Um, Cancer, um, any sort of autoimmune conditions that women are really prone to, all start with inflammation in the body. And why? A lot of it has to do with hormonal imbalance. A lot of it has to do with, you know, um, just the stress that we're constantly under. So just that ability to dampen um, the, um, you know, kind of inflammatory response, you know, women who have like rheumatoid arthritis, I, I put them on that. And of course, it's chocked full of all these minerals that they're not absorbing because their body is in such an inflammatory state that it actually helps digestion, it slows things down, and it just reduces that inflammation. And women say like, Oh, you know what, I'm doing so much better, like I'm not feeling that huge flare up. And because it's mm-hmm. giving that little bit of estrogen, it's giving that their their body, it's, it's soothing to the central nervous system system at the same time because their body's not working so hard from the stress of that of the estrogen levels being depleted. So that's kind of a piece I didn't share in my um, Instagram post. Uh, but another one that I absolutely love is Viola odorata, mm. um, you know, that that we have uh, here in Canada. So like the violet, right, the Canadian violet, it's here, you know, on my property, and I love it. It's such an amazing um when we talk about you know osteopathic principles you know my husband said like he'll have people that are just so their bodies are holding so tight and you know he's trying to open them up he's trying to open up that lymphatic drainage um and he just can't because of because structurally how their bodies are and it's it's very hard to undo years of sitting and that has just been a plant ally for me that's Mm -hmm. been and he's even found it amazing with his clients just for its um you know, ability to kind of stimulate that lymphatic flow. Mm. Um, And especially within for women, you know, we hold a lot of tension in our shoulders. And, you know, we obviously have breast tissue that, you know, adds strain to that. So 
you know, the left side of our body, that's where most of our lymphatic uh, drainage, that's where most of it occurs. But then what we'll notice, and especially too, when I'm working with women, because obviously, like I do cupping as well. Um, I learned at um, Ontario College of Traditional Chinese Medicine, a bit about cupping before I started the ND program. And of course, we, we do a lot of TCM in, in the naturopathic program here in Canada. But you'll notice a lot of stagnation. And you'll notice, you know, a lot of women like breast cancer, you know, cysts, fibrocystic breast, it starts on the right hand side, because the lymphatic drainage is just not as effective. That has been one herbal ally, either taking internally, or even putting on topically and just using like gua sha, I've noticed a huge difference, um, even in myself, you know, from you know, having so many digestive issues and, you know, hitting perimenopause, you know, I was getting that right side tenderness that I was like, Oh, this is not good. And, you know, it just helps that lymphatic flush in a way that I just can't explain. And then even for children, you know, just its calming properties. Um, my children love this violet syrup that my mm. prababcha used to make us before That's bed. Awesome. And it's just, you know, very soothing and especially if there's anxiousness, you know, kind of that flower, almost like a flower essences application of it. It's just, it's very soothing and it's very gentle because it's very cooling. It has very cooling properties. So when everything starts to heat up and your body's going through, even though it's a normal shift of, of season, you know, our bodies go through physiological stress. Um, so, you know, it helps soothe some of that you know, inflammation in our body and that tension and that heat that we start to bring in. And I know I'm talking more in TCM terms right now, but <laughs> it's, um, you know, it, it just helps soothe us and, and cool, you know, very overactive. And, you know, when children are upset and they're crying and they're hot and they're exerting all these heat, you give them that and it's just very calming to the nervous system. Um, so that's one of my, and of course, nettles. I mean, who doesn't love nettles, right? right? Um, the, you know, I have a whole nettle patch. My sister-in-law jokes though. She, she lives on a farm as well too. She, she went through the ND program and she's like, I live on a nettle farm. And, you know, for her, she, she suffers from like a lot of hot things like kidney stones and things like that. So she's like, nature's trying to tell me, cool it down. <laughs> so it's just one of those things, you know, for pain and, um, and really good, um, diuretic, right. Yeah. Um, flushing the system and just, you know, especially if you've been inactive and again, getting that lymphatic drainage, there's still that lymphatic action. Um, and then just all the minerals that we don't get, especially as women, you know, like iron, uh, magnesium, especially, you know, when women were pregnant and seeing me as a midwife, I'd be like, Hey, you need to drink infusions of nettles all day long. Uh, that's all I want to see it. We're going to get your hemoglobin levels up. And sure enough, it's just, it's like an, it's nature's iron pill. So. When in doubt, use nettles. Um, <laughs> thanks for sharing all that. Uh, do you have a little bit more time, Kara? Oh, awesome. for sure. Follow yeah. Up questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, awesome. Cool. Well, um, uh, fun fact, the state flower of Wisconsin is the violet and, um, uh, coming from Oregon, you know, I, we had violets there as well, of course, but then coming out here, seeing the violets growing in our front yard, they're just massive. And I just, yeah, I love that plant. I'm becoming more and more fond of it. Uh, when you're talking about the red clover, are you typically telling your clients to consume the tincture or are we talking like a uh, nourishing herbal infusions or how do you like them to consume it? So I do do tinctures for people who don't want infusions, but I think infusions when it comes to red clover is the best way to go. Um, you know, I think really the one thing that, there's a downfall. Like I, I love when people can just, you know, drop a tincture in their mouth or in a little bit of water, taste it. You know, yeah. I think just getting that digestive process going, I think that's part, you know, when you talk about neuroleptics, that's part of the process. Um, but I think that, you know, as much as we want to macerate that plant, I think there's something to be said about taking it you know, letting it just sit there for a few hours and, mm. and really concentrate in a way that, you know, there's also that mindfulness piece to it to give yourself that time to really reflect instead of, you know, being busy because part of part of our, you know, imbalances in our body is like, hey, I'm going to drink this down and I'm going to run to the office. It's like, <laughs> no, it's 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 that it's slowing down and it's actually appreciating what this plant is doing so that you can create this you know relationship between you and the plant which i think is very underrated absolutely couldn't couldn't agree more <laughs> awesome well a uh, couple more questions i was also seeing in your uh instagram oh we got a little chat from here 
Lako says, I'm drinking my red clover and nettle infusion right now. Ma Mahalo for the reminder and inspiration. That's awesome. Amazing. That's what uh, I have in my cup. It's nettle and red clover right now. So funny enough. I want to be a part of the cool kids club. All I have is coffee today. But... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a heart. All... I have a heart condition. Coffee and I are not friends. It's a no go. Yeah. No go. <laughs> Unless you want to come with me to the hospital for heart palpitation. <laughs> no, we better just stay away from it. Yeah. Um, so as I was saying on your Instagram account, this is not herbal related, but I, I really want to get to this because Amanda, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, she has Polish ancestry as well. And she also has a strong uh, draw to uh, crows. And uh, I was just wondering what the Polish symbolism is for crows. Yeah. So this is that, you know, there, there's a lot of superstition around them. So this is, um, you know, this is actually an animal that comes to me in my dreams. So a mm. lot of the, the, uh, belief comes from the Slavic, um, you know, symbolism and, and the Slavs essentially are the tribes that um, Polish and a lot of Central European people and Eastern European people came from with the exception of, of Russia. Pretty much anyone who speaks the Slavic language is part of those West Slavic tribes. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, the meanings have changed. But really what they saw crows as is that they were they were messengers. And so in the Slavic traditions, there's a lot of ancestral like worship. And we're not saying worship. So as like, you know, as in worshiping a deity, deity and praying to it, there's just this belief that life does not end when you die. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we talked about. I talked a lot about uh, with my great grandmother, um, you know, realizing, and as she was, you know, approaching her life, there, there is this belief that your soul transcends and you just, you live in a different way. And so they call this Navia. And so there are certain times in the year where you can connect more with your ancestors, but throughout the whole year, they're constantly looking over you. And so, especially during winter, which, you know, for the Polish peasants in the countryside, this was a time where, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty, you know, illness, food shortages. It's not like they could just go to their local grocery store. You know, these were remote isolated villages and, you know, far and few between were, were the resources you had. If, if, if you were caught short, you were caught short. And, you know, the weather there for anyone who's ever been to Poland is, is very, um, very, very, you know, bizarre, erratic. Um, so during these times, they would look for signs. And so one of the signs was a crow coming. And so it could mean, you know, a message from your ancestors. And this is one that I've, I've dreamt of a few times. Um, and so, but a lot of people would fear it because they could also be the messenger of death. And this comes from obviously, you know, earlier Slavic belief of, of certain deities that, that they saw as representations of nature. And so there is this belief of Marshana, who is, you know, it's death, birth, re, you know, rebirth. Um, you know, when spring comes, Marshana goes away. But during the cold winter, you know, everything lies dormant. And so everyone's waiting for that hope. And there's this longing and this waiting. And so the, these crows come and they give you a message. But people learn to fear them because if they say like, trup, trup, you know, like true, true. Yeah. That's that's like the word for what they like. It translates to corpses, but it's like dead bodies. So mm. it meant that death was coming. So people learn to fear them, but at the same time, um, you know, they they also saw it as you know a sign from their ancestors. You know, and and whatever they saw, you know, if it perched on a tree that was budding, you know, spring would come. My grandmother said, you know, they just when you grow up in a small village and you learn to appreciate the cycles and the seasons. And of course, you know, crows being around all year round, they were the messengers that could transcend, you know, these times and these cycles in nature. They were, they were constant. So they were both beloved and feared. <laughs> yeah. You said your grand, your great grandmother was born in 1902. I could just picture her as a little girl, you know, being able to pay attention to all these signs of nature, not with their phones in their faces all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, going through wars and border changes, right. you know, like she would say to me, you know, we knew war was coming or famine was coming because she wow. said like women would just stop getting pregnant. So they wow. were, these were people that were just so in tune with their yeah. environment. So, because really it was, you know, when we talk about that symbiotic relationship, 
they had to work that land. They knew everything about that land because the land was their livelihood, yeah. you know? So anything that threatened it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Amanda named one of our cats Corvus, which is the genus for crow. Yeah. Oh, so cute. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a rad cat. But um, I guess one last question. This is just kind of a selfish question, or <laughs> I just really like this topic. But like we talked about, you're a mother of four. You do so many different things. Um, how do you how do you view staying organized? Or um, do you have any tips or tricks for being organized and just accomplishing all that you do? Well, yes. I mean, you have to, I think first and foremost, um, a lot of people see everything that I do and there's a lot of things that don't get done. So we're going to be real, <laughs> you know, you, respect. I like that. Yeah, you have to be real. Like I yeah. would love to say I'm superwoman. I mean, I do have like coming from a Polish Canadian, like being Polish Canadian, coming from a Polish family, like we work, 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 work. If yeah. there's one thing I knew how to do, it was work. And from a very young age, I knew how to work hard. I, I will say that I have to, I've had to teach myself to take those moments. Um, so in, in wanting to accomplish everything, one, know that you have to prioritize, but number two, you will be far more productive if you take that time for yourself. And, you know, I know self-care is such a catchy phrase. Yeah. And when you're a mom or, you know, you're a business owner and you're constantly go, 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 like there's no nine to five. It's like, constantly going you have to really put in those boundaries and those parameters of when do I give to myself and what does that look like what is possible but what does that look like and it's not just you know how we see on Instagram like bubble baths and candles it's like <laughs> what are you eating you know are you actually sleeping you have to really put things into practice and there are times when yeah you know you have a huge deadline you're going to maybe skimp out on a few things, but know that you're going to pay. Um, so keeping that in, um, so giving yourself that time. But I think just, you know, making sure that whatever you're doing, you really love um, mm -hmm. as much as you can. You know, there are components. And so you have to really, I think a lot of it is mindset. Um, you know, there's times when I'm exhausted and there's times when I'm like doing this master's and I'm like, you know, I love research, but you know, I love sitting in front of people and walking through their health journeys and stepping away from the ND program for a year was really hard. But I think mm. I had to really look at what I wanted to accomplish. And I think you have to keep that kind of guiding vision at the end of the day. And I like I write sticky notes for myself and then calendars. I have a whole wall over here of sticky notes with actually what I have to do in a day. And I write myself lists. And what was so funny during my undergraduate education, because I, you know, did a lot of theory on healthcare and, you know, just all of the issues that evolve from modern healthcare, you know, all of the barriers in that. And one of the biggest things that actually reduces, which I found so profound, that reduces the incidence of death and um, adverse effects in an operating room is a nurse who goes through a checklist with doctors. Mm. So utilize checklists. They are life-saving. You cannot forget it if it's there, right there in your face. And it's saying, I need to get done. Good tip. Um, so that that is how I do it. And then, you know, really looking at my skill sets. Like my my husband is such a vital part of that. I think, you know, for you, yourself and Amanda, like you yep. become a team. Yep. So if you have that person, rely on them, you know, co-create a life that just make sense and that you two can really lean on each other for strengths because I'm going to tell you people say oh you're such a powerhouse I'm like honestly my husband hates Instagram he hates social media you think I'm amazing just wait till you meet him like <laughs> he is like he pushes me to be the best version of myself and likewise I think that yeah, that's so we're cool. really a reflection of who we who we are with and I happen to share my life with someone who's so incredible he's just you know, less likely to to talk about what it is he's doing. So I think if you have that partner, you know, involve them and 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 really make your life about, you know, living together and creating a life together. I love all of that. And Kara, we got to make a trip up to Toronto because I'd love to hang out with you and your husband and maybe tour the farm. And uh, yeah, maybe we could get uh, your husband on the show too. That'd be so cool. Oh yeah. You would love him. You'd, you guys would like <laughs> get along pretty well but no we'd love to have you you're welcome anytime i love very, visitors to the farm so. very cool well i'm not just saying this i was very inspired by this episode kara thank you and i learned a lot as well so yeah this has been a lot of fun getting to know you 
Uh, we haven't even said the website yet. We said the Instagram, but it's um, <laughs> we're, I, I want to say it's herbfieldhomestead.com or is it the herb? The Herbfields Homestead. Yeah. Thank I you. Think, yeah. <laughs> so learn more, <laughs> learn more about care and her work. Let me just double check here. Let me make sure that it's too. I'm checking on. That's how busy I am. I'm like, oh my right. God, <laughs> or is it her? Might be her filled homestead. That's how much I, you know, work from the back end of my website. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's the herb filled. Okay, I am right. Okay, good. I yep, you right. got it. The herb filled homestead. Just had to make sure. I'm always working from the back side, and uh, we actually are going to be redesigning it because it was me oh. doing it in between of studying for finals. Because during, you know, the last craziness of the last few years, people were like, I just want to do remote pickups from a website. So I was sitting there studying hours, building a website. Don't recommend it. <laughs> well, it still looks good even as of the current iteration. But yeah, if very good. Well, dear listener, check out theherbfieldhomestead.com. Also the Herb Filled Homestead on Instagram. And uh, yeah, any uh, like closing thoughts before we wrap up and get out of here, Kara? Um. Yeah, like I, I just want to say thank you for having me on here. Like, honestly, I, I have to say, like, I have loved all of the work that you're doing. You oh, know, thanks. I think that, you know, I, I don't maybe you don't realize the impact you've had. I've really admired everything you're doing, because I think especially during the craziness of the last few years, a lot of people have felt really isolated. And especially for people, you know, just stepping into herbalism, yeah. they may feel like at a loss of you know, where's my community? And I think that's what really Herb Rally is. And I, I just have to speak like from that place of appreciation, because I know through Herb Rally, I've made some really phenomenal connections. And I'm a member of your schoolhouse. Like I, I love know. it. I'm Thank constantly you. learning. And, mm. you know, I, I absolutely love all the work you're doing. I wear my Herb Rally t-shirt all the time <laughs> at our farmer's market. And they're like, where did you get that t-shirt? I'm like, Herb Rally, check it out. It's amazing. That's so, so cool. Um, Thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to chat with you. Oh, you made my day, Kara. Really appreciate <laughs> those kind words. I'll, I'll be sure to, well, I was going to say I'll pass along the kudos to Amanda as well, but she'll be editing this so she'll hear it straight from you. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. And um, awesome. Well, we'll wrap it up right there and um, end the show. And thanks everybody for listening. And we'll see you in the next one. And that's going to do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Herb Rally podcast. If you'd like to hear more from us here at Herb Rally, we now have a text message community, believe it or not. Basically, it's just updates from us. We send about one to seven texts per week, uh, notifying you about new events, videos, courses, podcasts. You get the idea. It's pretty much like our email newsletter, just in text form. So if you'd like to receive text messages from Herb Rally, just text JOIN, that's J-O-I-N, to the number 541-256-2895. Again, that's join to number 541-256-2895. And to stop receiving texts, that's easy too. Just text STOP to the same number. It'll opt you out immediately. Okay, thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your day.